Can someone in the audience tell me what they can see on this screen? Yell it out. So you see Lego men, what are they doing? They're break dancing. So if I were to ask you who's teaching who, what would you say? Hands up if you think it's the super cool looking rapper dude on the left hand side. Hands up if you think he's the one coaching the, the uh, gentleman on how to balance. We've got a few hands up there. Hands up if you think it's the um, old guy in the bow tie rocking the break dancing moves. Hands up if you think he's the one who's teaching the young one a few new tricks. Thanks. So as you can see, the, the picture can be interpreted in two different ways. And I think that this is what we see in medicine all around us. When I first started doing medicine, I thought, oh my goodness, it'll be so great. I'll be able to practically help people. And the way I imagined that happening was in treating illnesses, suturing up kids, and um, you know, uh, delivering um, empathic conversations and communicating with families. But I find that as my time gets on, not that I've had that much time, yes, um, that we also have to wear a lot of other hats in medicine as well. That of administrative clerk, that of barista sometimes, that of photocopier and fax maintenance. Tap it on the left twice and it'll start working again. But most often, I put on the hat of teacher or learner. That's why this talk is about teaching old docs new tricks, but equally, it's about teaching new docs old tricks as well. So as a learner, I'm a first year trainee in pediatrics. So there's a wealth of pediatric knowledge that I've yet to attain. But even now, where I'm standing as a first year trainee, I've sought to give back. And that's done through peer to peer teaching and also by tutoring medical students. Because no matter where you are, there's always going to be someone ahead of you who can lean the way. And there's always going to be someone behind you who you can help up. So how do we do this? How do we become better teachers? How do we um, learn how to communicate better with students? And how do you engage with juniors like me? First of all, I think it's really important to use the existing structures we have. I believe that uh, formal teaching needs to be energized. Put up your hands if this slide looks familiar. Have you seen a slide like this before in lectures, in conferences, anywhere at workplace? Unfortunately, um, through the over 1,000 of lectures that I've had to sit through or suffer through, a lot of the lectures have been given just like this. It's didactic. It's word heavy. So one of my big tips for energizing formalized teaching is energizing your presentation, energizing how you communicate. If you're in a lecture scenario, how can you convey information that is not just a copy paste of a textbook? A study showed that 82% of university students, when they were given a PowerPoint presentation, wrote down word for word what was on the slides. You really have to ask yourself when you're teaching an audience, what are they going to remember? What are they going to take home? If they were just going to memorize the pre prevention of osteoporosis with calcium and vitamin D, did you need to be there? What was the point of you being there? Because whenever we are in a position of teaching, which we all are, we have something unique and specific to us that we can share with our learners. So in terms of practically energizing your teaching, I'm a bit of a slide nerd, so, so that's one of my um, sort of pet issues, is, is how can you energize your slides to help complement your talk? So this is an example. So you break down your slide. Oh, sorry, rote learning is a means, not an end. Um, and so we create meaning. So you break down your slide to this. So, so before, you didn't know what was going on. I could have just read out the slides. When given together, there's a greater increase. Blah, blah, blah. You're falling asleep as you know it, or you're just reading. You're not paying attention to me. So when I break it down, you can clearly see the key messages. So I say, you know, calcium is really important. You can get it from different sources in your diet. But it's really important for kids to build bone mineral density, and it reduces vertebral fractures in the elderly. Vitamin D does this. And together, they're powerful because together, studies have shown that they prevent osteoporosis, not alone, 
but together. So by delivering your talks in a way that is structured, that is broken down into smaller bits, you can become more effective in your presentations. This is another example, the case studies. Case studies are wonderful ways of, of engaging us because often as junior doctors, we don't know um, what to focus on or we say, oh, you know, this is an interesting bit of cardiac anatomy, but, but does it really make a difference to me? So for me, I think that case studies uh, can be a powerful way of using narrative to convey ideas. And that's how you can break it down. So you take, a big chunk of text, a big case study, and you can break it down into something simpler. A 42-year-old father and engineer, you're creating emotional ties with your audience. You're making it something that they can identify with. All of us have fathers. Most of us might know an engineer or two, and that has relevance and meaning. It makes them invested in the case, and they want to find out what happens next. Uh, one of the comments that we talked about is how do you get students and junior doctors and nurses and healthcare practitioners involved in flipped classrooms? I think that this is one tool to suck them in. Build a case studies around it. Have videos or snippets or you know, have, have one of the students act as a model in front of the class so that people get emotional buy-in and then intellectual buy-in. I want to help this 42-year-old father and engineer get better. What do I need to know? What are my responsibilities in doing the reading in order to learn the knowledge that will enable me to treat his five weeks of polyuria, polydipsia, and lethargy? Another really important way of energizing formal teaching is flipping the classroom. Salim has already talked about it, so I won't go into too much detail, but this is something that I really um, appreciate and got a lot of when I went to the teaching conference. Um, and the basic tenets, as he mentioned, is that you give the learners the material first, and then that enables you to apply the knowledge and spend the time that you have with them discussing so that as a teacher um, in your formal role, you can use your own expertise and really tease out what the learners know, what they had problems with, how did they battle with that textbook or that literature review, did they agree or didn't they agree, and then work from that point of view. Training together is something that's really important as well. In emergency medicine, um, simulation um, is, is a very important part of how people have been delivering medical education. But I would argue that simulation and training together as teams doesn't just happen in an emergency situation when you're going to do a cricothyroid doctor. Economy. What you also need to do is think about how do we train for, for our day-to-day -day jobs? You know, how do we train together to give an effective handover? How do we train together to deliver bad news? How do we train together to develop critical thinking skills in a journal club type of situation? So I think that it's really important to um, use the team model and not just the individual model in order to strengthen how we learn and how we teach. Gamification. So not only do you have to train hard, you also have to play hard. So I think that there's lots of ways that we can appeal to us Gen Ys who are stuck to our iPads and iPhones playing, playing Pokemon Go or what have you um, to get them more involved in teaching. And one of those ways is gamification. One example of this is in my own hospital at Sydney Kids, uh, we've got something called the Jungle Audit or the Jungle Project. And what that is, is um, we go around, we have a look look at people's um, uh, medical charts, and we look at how many people have guidance, which is the antimicrobial stewardship program. And then it all goes up on a big team leaderboard for people to um, feel a sense of ownership as a team and a sense of competition. Oh, the surgeons, are they good at doing guidance? Are they terrible at doing guidance? Versus the hematology oncologist, you know, who's better? And it's this kind of healthy competition making a seemingly mundane but important task into a bit of a game that can help get people um, encouraged, motivated, and actually contribute significantly to patient safety. If you're teaching medical students, there's lots of games pre-existing out there that you can refer to them as a bit of fun time, free time homework. For example, Microbe Invaders is a Pokemon style game where you go around the hospital and you treat patients who have you know, abdominal pain and, and you take blood cultures and you apply what gram stain and then you get a result and you can prescribe what antibiotic to give. So there's lots of educational ways that you can um, implement in your own teaching or for your learners when they're at home. 
Uh, Qstream is something that's a little bit more professional looking, a little bit more savvy. That's just simply one of many platforms where you can get your learners and yourself on a platform and you can push um, questions to them, they can give feedback and you can see what they're doing. So that's a nice way of um, breaking down knowledge, testing people's knowledge. You could use it, like Salim says, before you're about to give a talk and a presentation so you can gauge what they know, or you could give it after a talk, a presentation to gauge what they remember or to prompt them to say, oh, maybe I should look up what she said or, or look up what, they, what paper they had told us about. And then there's self-directed learning. When, when I was in uni, that was the big catchphrase that you had to memorize for your portfolio, which is like this interview. Yes, we're doing interviews during med school as well these days. Um, and in part of self-directed learning, although we may have mocked it when I, back when I was in med school, it's actually very much true. At the end of the day, there's only so much information you can push onto people. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And so sometimes one of the best ways to motivate learners and get them engaged is to let them drive themselves. In that case, maybe a teacher doesn't always have to teach. Maybe a learner can learn from the students. Maybe a teacher can facilitate a process or help provide that initial spark for learners to get involved. So I see this everywhere with foam. There's foam for med students. There's medical students creating foam. An example is um, On the Wards, which is a website which um, junior doctors and trainees write uh, blog posts. So for example, On the, on the Wards, um, I've written to registrars and consultants and found out what their tips are to give a good consult. And then we share that knowledge. We share that online. And because we are driving it ourselves, we know what our needs are. We know what questions we have. And so then that helps to motivate us to get there. The AMSJ is another example that stands for the Australian Medical Student Journal. So um, when I was in first year in uni, um, we realized that there's all this wealth of, of publications, but it's really difficult to know what to do, how to get published, and, and it seemed very overwhelming, you know, the documentations to, to apply for ethics approval alone were, were pretty challenging for us first starting medicine. And we said, well, what can we do? What do we need? What we needed was a safe space, a space to grow, a stepping stone towards developing our skill as researchers. And so we got together and um, a, a team of seniors decided to form the Australian Medical Student Journal. And what that does is it's a student journal that is run by students, which publishes student research and is completely from the layout to the fundraising to the, the journal articles put together by students themselves. And it really engages and encourages students to learn what does it mean to do good research, what is the process like, and we kind of do a, a mock review of it. But it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have teachers and lecturers and consultants involved. So these consultants for us act as peer reviewers. They also provide guidance because at the end of the day, even though we're as juniors, we recognize that there are limits to our knowledge. And so in this symbiotic relationship, we as students can drive knowledge and understanding, but we get feedback from teachers and consultants and peer reviews in order to improve and develop our skills. Teaching on the go. Sometimes it seems like there's not enough time to teach. You've got to manage your kids at home. You've got to manage your other priorities, stressful life situations, illness. Or sometimes you might just be in an overworked ED department. But it's very important that we teach on the go. And the reason is this, the pancake theory. So I heard this theory from a friend of a friend. And it goes something like this. If you're going to study for an examination, learn a procedural skills, it's like imagining you have to eat 100 pancakes. See, the smart ones out there would eat a pancake a day for three or four months, and they would get there. But some of the others, like you and me, we might decide we'll cram. And so we'll say, oh, no, it, uh, it's so, such a long time away. 100 pancakes, easy, no problem, I can do that. It gets to a month in advance, you're like, oh, no, I think I'm going to have to eat three pancakes a day. It gets to five days, and you're like, 20 pancakes a day, I think I'm going to be sick. So the moral of the story from the pancake theory is little by little, goes a long way and stops you from getting sick. 
So how do we do this? How do we teach on the go in little bites? There's lots of different ways to do it, but one of the things that I've found helpful has um, been through the Allium team, and it's called Post-it Pearls or Whiteboard Teaching. There's a hashtag on Twitter. You can even see what other people have done for it. And, and what that means is when you're teaching on a round at the bedside or in the ED, you stop and take a minute and say, what can we learn from this patient? Get a Sharpie, write it down on a post-it. Perhaps, like the Alien team say, perhaps the answer in a high-tech world can be a low-tech solution. The b benefit of a post-it, you can move it, you can stick it at a computer, you can stick it in a whiteboard, you can make your own post-its and stick them in the bathroom when you're brushing your teeth, and that creates, like Salim was talking about, spaced repetition, and that helps people to retain knowledge and really take home the key points that you wanted them to learn from it. It's also a really good um, strategy because you can do it as a consultant or a registrar, but even as a med student, you too can bring on your own post-it pearls to the ward, to the team. Investigate. Now, there are studies that suggest that giving primary school kids more homework is less effective for learning than letting them have another hour of sleep. I think that with homework, with learning, it all has to be framed to size. But I do believe that we should be giving junior doctors like me or medical students homework in the sense of when you do a ward round, if you've got a patient with a new diagnosis or something um, unusual, let's say you have a child with allergies, you'll say, okay, can you tell me the facial features that you would see in allergies? And if they don't know, you say, okay, that's your job, look it up. So I've had a few doctors do that for me, and that's been helpful, and I do look it up. But what really made me um, take, stop and take note were the doctors who remembered to ask. And it can be just as simple as having a notes on your iPhone or your, um, or your Android phone and just making a note, Grace look up features of allergies. And when you remember to ask them the next day, that reinforces it. Because if you stop asking, no offense to my peers, but we get lazy. We say, oh, they're always asking us to remember a thousand things and we've got too much time. We need to do all these discharges. We don't have time to look these things up. But if we know that there's a little bit of stress, a little bit of pressure, but it's a manageable goal, we'll be able to do it and say, Yes, Dr. Stein, I have looked up allergies, and it's this, this, and this. And then you can further the question. So then when would you refer for genetic testing? Or what would you be worried about if you saw a child who had these features? Or how would you counsel parents if you notice these features in their child? So investigating and encouraging investigating and independent curiosity is really valuable. Providing guidance. Contrary to what some people might believe, as a junior doctor, I really like having proper supervision. It makes us feel safe. It enables us to make mistakes and know that we're not going to be bringing ultimate harm to our patients. This is particularly true when learning procedural skills. I remember the first time I had to give intrathecal methotrexate and I was terrified. But the fact that I had my fellow literally behind my back, but at a safe space away, and not scrubbed in, but able to offer help if I needed it, helped me feel calm, comfortable, and confident to perform the procedure. So providing guidance is important, but not just providing guidance in procedures, providing guidance for the longer term. I feel that, you know, thinking about my primary exams coming up in Feb 2019, all my, you know, focus and thoughts goes into, you know, how do I prepare for this examination? How will I get through? But sometimes we can miss the bigger picture. And as consultants, as fellows, as senior doctors ahead of me, you're able to provide that insight and say, look, Grace, yes, your exams are important. But what do you need to know that will equip you to become a compassionate consultant? What do you need to know that will help you in the long run? So I think providing guidance in the short term and long term is a really valuable part of the relationship. And giving feedback. It's important to give specific 
and timely feedback. Vic Brazil has a fantastic talk on giving feedback from Smack, which you should all re uh, watch. Um, but scaling it to size is also important. So when you give feedback, you want to be specific. You want to be timely. But you also want to pitch it. If you pitch it too high, people will be overwhelmed. If you pitch it too low, people will say, well, what do I need to learn? How do I change? We don't know how to do that and create opportunities for redemption. Because we will stuff up, we will make mistakes. One of my most poignant learning moments was uh, when I was working in ED and I did an LP for a child and I put the um, CSF in the tray for the, um, the um, orderlies to pick up um, and I paged the orderly, but I didn't check whether it had gone. And the consultant 20 minutes later said, Grace, where's the CSF results? And I said, oh, it's not on the computer. And I check the tray, and the CSF is still sitting there. And that particular consultant went on in the, in the team round and said, our CSF took a million years to get there, but we got there in the end. How did that make me feel? He was trying to use humor, which is a plus, but actually I really felt terrible that I had forgotten that crucial Point. And, I, and I felt even worse that he kind of made light of it and exaggerated my mistake in front of all my peers. It was embarrassing. What did I learn then? Two weeks later, we had another kid who had an LP, which I didn't perform. One of the registrars who was there that day performed it. And he said, here, Grace, here's the CSF. Will you get it to the lab for me? And I did. And then when we came to the group teaching at that handover, he said, so I did an LP on so-and-so, and Grace here made sure it got to the lab on time. That was giving me an opportunity for redemption. Not only did he recognize that I had made a mistake, and I recognized that too, he then gave me an opportunity to change the story, to change the outcome, and to make a difference. So we've talked about this, and I'm out of time, and we've talked about this, which is convenient. So just to recap, when we teach and learn, we're doing that for a lifetime. We want to do it engagingly, as a team, self-directed. We can do it on the go by giving clear feedback and creating opportunities for learning, but also opportunities for redemption. We can be multiplied by foam, and it needs to be built within a relationship. I'm going to close with this. One of my dad's favorite proverbs was, if you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you'll teach him for a lifetime. So I hope that all of you are inspired that as educators, we're not just teaching our junior doctors, nurses, paramedics, or allied health what to think, but how to think as well. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. That um, was really, really good in putting a lot of the stuff that, the, that Sal and Nikki had talked about into the context of the trainee. Casey, any, any yeah, questions from Twitter? One question. In the early days of foam, you know, <laughs> when I say early days, like five years ago. Um, <laughs> there was back a, when? <laughs> way back when I was in my 30s. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, people saying, where's the quality control? As a junior doctor in 2017, is that still an issue? Is that something that we need to worry about? Do you see your colleagues you know, using resources that maybe aren't great? How does it happen? Um, there's a few components to that question. I suppose the first one is, is there a quality issue still with foam? Yes, of course. Foam is a reflection of community. It's a reflection of the internet, just as this great knowledge on Google, there's also a lot of um, sites that um, would be misleading, you know, anti-vaxxers, for example. There's lots of information out there that can be misused. So that's why I think it is really important that we appreciate all the benefits that foam can bring, but true bedside teaching, in-person teaching, is irreplaceable and very crucial. And it's in this 
um, type of modality that we can learn how to think critically, how to critically appraise, because this works for journal articles as well. It's not just foam that's the victim of this. There's tons of research in journals which is uh, poorly, poorly recruited, you know, they kind of retrospectively find decisions. There's, there's lots of issues in research and, and medicine as a whole. So I think that by learning critical appraisals, by taking it on yourself to be responsible for your juniors and making sure that you provide safe supervision, that they'll be able to access resources. In terms of the second part of your question, which is do I see my peers getting into wrong websites? To be honest, not really, um, mainly because um, sort of more reputable or credible websites tend to have more traction. So the people who are more on the peripheral outskirts will tend to delve straight into Life in the Fast Lane or some or, you know, Arkham, something which has like a college recommendation or backup. But I mean it's true. It, it's there and, and I'm sure that there are some people who have been misled, but you take the good and the bad together.